In high school, I hated Black History Month. It always felt like a quick fix to the problem that history doesn't support our history, that the history we subscribe to doesn't bomb black pages, there's no renaissance in its spine, not enough reconstruction in the structure those slaves built, the infrastructure. What history do you subscribe to? When I picture Black History Month, all I see is how far we've come and how tired we are now that we've made it. Minds raped, cultures stolen, the firstborn slaves' birth certificates were written copies of death wishes. Someone explained to me the difference between death and not knowing. When we were young and this nation, master kept us from written word. Afraid we'd learn our stories. Afraid we'd read the Bible and feel like Moses. He'd have to part the seeds of black on our flesh to separate the passion from the skin. When you separate the cause from the effect, all you project is broken. In Texas, they use fourth grade reading scores to project how many prison cells they're going to need. The crime is not the crime. It's the society that create the mind. The crime sounds like freedom that doesn't ring three-fifths of the time. Sounds like African wind chimes on the old Virginia road. Sounds like Willie Lynch was Hitler's ghostwriter. If you want to kill the spirit separated from its body, take the Kuntas from the Tobis. Take the men from the women. Take the women from the children. Take the children from their culture. Put them in school. Celebrate what they've done, but make it harder for them to do it again. I heard someone say racism doesn't exist because blacks are going to college. I told them racism exists because our schools aren't designed for us to succeed once we make it there. They asked me why I'm so mad, why I talk with so much salt on my voice. If I hold my tongue, my throat will be the same middle passage that kept slavery alive like a teenage girl's secret. My people have learned to tell their story in a cadence that matches their offshore heartbeats. As long as it's broken, you will hear this breathing. This is street politics. You make it out, you haven't sent. All girls ain't celibate. All girls just celibate. Our streets are paved with blood stains and dirty faces, dry tears and chalk lines, hop scotch for bullet cases. Never knew what love was, but realized what pain is. Choked by dope, don't give a what hope is. The young and the restless, the broke arrested, giving blacks a hundred years for crimes confessed. It. Black on black crimes is cold for genocide. The taking of black lives, the loss of black pride. We lost the dark side. Recovery, there's no time. Bullet shaking, body shaking towns, we wasting time and young lies, preaching lies and hating. Lyrics are like liquor for the fallen soldier. I feed my people rum by the case like Corona. This is a declaration. The crime is not the crime. It's the society that created the mind. Fallen bodies are forming the SOS, spelling double entendre on the sidewalk. Looks like low income. Looks like my brother, but homonym shouldn't look so familiar. How long will we create doors without making the keys to open them? How long Will we separate the cause from the effect and project us as broken? Open the doors. In one month, blacks won't have to be history. February 2015, my hatred continues. I graduated from Bel Air High School in 2010. And this fall, I returned to East Baton Rouge Parish High Schools with a different objective than what I left with. In addition to my mission to learn all I can, it's now my job to teach all I can as an East Baton Rouge Parish secondary English teacher. And that troubles me. I believe in Louisiana. I believe with its culture, its customs, and its people, Louisiana is one of the best places this world has to offer. But I also believe in its potential to be far greater. I believe in the idea of Louisiana greatly impacting its citizens and greatly impacting this world. Looking back through history, I've seen that. I've seen a man from Baton Rouge lead the first ever successful bus boycott. Then I saw from there the same Baton Rouge bus boycott mimicked by Dr. Martin Luther King and the SCLC on a much larger scale. Louisiana has greatly impacted this world. We've seen it. We're living in it. Louisiana has the potential to create a lot more chain reactions. But Louisiana has a problem. And it's not a small problem. Our public education system. Regardless how it happens, the most important thing is students receive a quality education. But how do we define quality? When I graduated from Bel Air High School in 2010, Louisiana was ranked 44th in the nation in terms of education. Almost half of the high schools in my parish were either labeled as failing or were in danger of being taken over. And the year after I graduated, my alma mater made it to the top of the list of high schools in danger of being taken over. I consider myself blessed to be where I am today. Not because of the number attached to my education, but because gradually over the years, I realized that myself and many of my peers, despite how capable we were, were underprepared for many of the things that came next. We realized that our high schools had given us a lot, but it hadn't given all of us the tools necessary to make it to the next chapter in life that we wanted. If we wanted to go to trade school, 
or the armed forces. All the tools were there. But if you wanted to go to college, it wasn't that simple. My situation wasn't unlike all students. Obstacles I faced in life and education mirror some of the most staggering facts and statistics about inner cities and public schools. And I'm sure to some people, nothing about where I'm from or what I experienced suggests I should be where I am today. In high school, I worked two jobs. One part-time with my dad laying bricks and doing carpentry. The other near full-time at Sonic on Corsi Boulevard. All this while my dad was struggling with newly diagnosed congestive heart failure and diabetes. While my mom was momentarily consumed by alcoholism and depression. While my family was in constant jeopardy of losing the house that we lived in since I was two years old and my older brother was in and out of prison. My high school years were haunted by the fear of what came next. The fear of what came next paralyzed me. So like most people in that situation, rather than focusing on the present, I focused on the possibility. In 2008, I took the practice ACT test, and I scored a 12. And those possibilities were limited. I needed an 18 to get into most colleges and higher than that for any chance of a scholarship. I didn't know what to do. I needed an outlet. Then one day at school, I heard Principal Webb say that poetry team sign-ups would be after school. So I showed up. And there was about eight of us there. So we sat and we waited. Then the poetry coach, a civics teacher named Mr. Khan, showed up. And he said that we had three minutes to prepare and that auditions would be in the classroom in the next three minutes. So we should go in the hallway and prepare. I just remember thinking, what does he mean, auditions? <laughs> because at this point in my life, I never wrote a poem before in my entire life. So I went to the hallway and I wrote my first poem in five minutes. I came back, read what I wrote. Somehow, I made callbacks, and then I made the team. Three months in a poetry championship later, poetry was my passion. I had all new friends and a teacher I was learning to call friend and mentor. And then Mr. Khan explained something to me. He told me he was quitting teaching to start an organization that would help first-generation college students and under-resourced students get into the college of their dreams, and he wanted me to be in the first official class. So that fall, I was a member of BRIC, the Baton Rouge Youth Coalition. I received free ACT prep, academic tutoring, emotional support, and I engaged in intellectual conversations with students my own age from across the city. And a trend I was seeing was I wasn't the only student that felt like the schools were leaving us underprepared in the face of college. We knew we were going to struggle, but we knew if we did well enough, the program could function for another year with a whole new group of high school seniors. Out of the 15 of us that started, 12 of us actually finished. Some of us managed huge jumps on our ACT. The end result was the 12 of us earned a combined total of $600,000 in scholarships. As for me, I earned a $100,000 scholarship to the University of Wisconsin-Madison for my spoken word poetry, the first wave urban arts scholarship, a scholarship that fully encompasses arts, academics, and activism. I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for BRIC. BRIC is a godsend. Since its first class in 2009, BRIC has helped over 65 predominantly first-generation college students matriculate to colleges, earning a combined total of over $4 million in scholarships. The real issue here is there's still a lot of gaps in our education system for first-generation college students and under-resourced students, and there aren't enough BRICs to go around. In terms of numbers, Louisiana's education system has come a long way. In Education Week's Quality Counts report, Louisiana managed to move up from rank 44 to 15 in just five years. To me, being out of state, that sounded undeniably amazing. But the rude awakening came next. This past summer, I was, hired at, I was hired as the program director for the Baton Rouge Youth Coalition. And I learned something about the state of education in Louisiana. You can't learn from just looking at the numbers. I learned that from the student perspective, while many improvements have been made, not much have been made as far as postgraduate preparation. My students' complaints echoed my own. Great grades with bad test scores, and the feeling that teachers and administration only thought they can go to trade schools and armed forces because those are the only presenters that came during class time. This is the push to mediocrity. Improving education and Louisiana starts with improving preparation for the real world. And any evaluation of education shouldn't just be an evaluation of graduation rates and test scores by which the school is evaluated. It should include what comes next and the options that are available for students after they graduate. I believe if we do, 
the numbers would tell a very different story about how far we've come in terms of educational inequality. There's a correlation between race and achievement, largely because there's a correlation between race and resources. We need to increase talent and youth's access to resources and educate them about their options. I know that if we open a door one month, blacks won't have to be history. Thank you.